So if you have this idea of rectilineal figures, which are polygons plus, and then we defined area on rectilineal figures, the next logical conclusion or question really is, well, what about circles? Well, it's true, we haven't defined area on circles yet. And it turns out when people were looking at this hundreds of years ago, in fact, one of the first people who looked at it was, first people, plural here, Euclid, Archimedes, et cetera, and there were probably more as well that just weren't as famous. So lots and lots of time ago, before we even had defined Hilbert geometry. And they said, hey, we have circles all the time. We, we use circles in, almost as much as straight lines and polygons. We would love to know what the area of a circle is. And they said, well, that's difficult. So one of the things that people looked at was something called this nice little Latin phrase right here, which I'm totally gonna butcher in the pronunciation, quadrica, not even close. There was a T there, I said is a K. Circuli, again, probably not that close. What does this actually mean? That is roughly speaking translated as squaring the circle. That's a rough translation. Now, what does it mean? What it means is it was the idea of people trying to find the area of a circle. And specifically, it wasn't just to find the area of a circle. Somebody or many people, because this was, I don't want to say a trend, but a thing that people tried to do for a while. They wanted to find a square that had the exact same area as a circle. Now this is a tie-in to dissections that we just got out of. Remember what happened, you were given some figure and you wanted to cut it up into pieces, reassemble it and get a new figure with those same pieces. And what happened with dissections? If you actually had two figures that could be dissected into each other or were equivalent by dissection, it had the same area. So people push that forward with respect to a circle and a square. Okay? Now the construct with a straight edge and a compass says it's something that we could actually physically create. It's not just a pie in the sky idea, okay? Now, in order to be able to do that, we had to figure out, or people had to figure out, how we would deal with the area of a circle. And please note, when people were first looking at this, this was before they knew what pi was. This is actually how our concept of that special number pi came into being, or how people started getting what it was, okay? So, here's the idea. Not scrolling down, just a second. Okay. So we need this idea of what's the area of a circle. And let me go ahead and write what I just said here. Note, for us, area is currently defined for rectilineal figures. Rectilineal figures, i.e. figures that don't have curved lines. So here's the concept of area, and it actually is in your book. This um, famous problem of this squaring the circle is in uh, chapter five, section 25 for reference. So the first proposition, and it's teeny tiny, itty bitty short section because it only deals with this one concept. The first proposition 25.1 goes as follows. It says, all right, well, first of all, we're gonna have a Euclidean plane. And remember, a Euclidean plane is Hilbert plane Plus, we also have that circle axiom, that axiom with a capital E. That means circles play nicely with each other and other lines. And it also means we have Playfair's axiom. That means we're going to be able to do the multiplication of line segments, one of those things that we like to do with the area. And we also have this axiom A, which was called the Archimedes axiom. And this one here deals with, basically, you can scale up things. You can make copies of things and not in the very basic way that we think of, perhaps as soon as I say that, but in a little bit more substantial way. So here's what we're given. We're gonna get, be given some circle, and I'll have this picture of the circle here come up in just a second. We'll call this circle gamma. What we're gonna do is we're gonna find an inscribed polygon that we'll call P, so that's the polygon that's gonna be inside of the circle, and a circumscribed polygon P prime, that's gonna be the polygon that's outside the circle, such that the area of the circumscribed polygon, so the bigger, polygon, subtract the area of the inscribed polygon is less than any given quantity. Now, that right there is a very precise way in mathematics of saying we actually have a limit involved. And if you didn't pick that up, that's okay, it's subtle. The way to tell that 
it's only if you've ever seen epsilon delta proofs of limits in the past. So if what I just said sounded like gobbledygook with epsilon delta proofs or epsilon delta definition of a limit, don't worry, I'm about to show you what this means. So here's what it means. So I went ahead and prepped up for us a picture. And, and what we have is, I went ahead and put the words over here because we are covering up the statement of that last proposition. We've got with the circle, the circle here is in black, so that's the original thing we started with. So let me go ahead and label that circle with a gamma for its name. And we have our original circumscribed polygon. This is the guy that is this quadrilateral shape, okay? the one that's in that sort of purplish color. And then we also have the inscribed polygon, which turned out to not quite be a square when I created him a little bit ago, but a square slash rectangle. It's a rectangle that's close to being a square. Now, in order to look at this difference here of the two areas of the two polygons, notice just straightforward of finding that difference is you find the area of each of these two rectangles, you subtract them, and when you subtract them, you'll find this little strip around the outside. I'm not going to shade it in, but I'll do that in the next step. Okay? And it's some value. Now, there's no guarantee that it's less than whatever given quantity that somebody tells you, so maybe that would mean or that would mean if it's not less than whatever this given number is that somebody wants you to deal with, what that would mean is you picked the wrong inscribed and circumscribed polygons. Okay? So here's the second step. So the second step is if that difference is too big, you're going to create a second inscribed polygon and circumscribed polygon. So create a new inscribed polygon, and we'll be lazy and call this guy P2, so this is the second one we did, and a new circumscribed polygon, and we'll also call this guy P2, but with the prime, just because it's the second one we did. Okay. Now, technically speaking, as long as those new polygons have more sides than your first set of polygons, it'll work out just fine. But if you want to be a little bit more strategic here, here's a process. So this would be by having the central angles. Of the original polygons, so of P1 and P1 prime. Now, what would that mean in practice? So if we look at the inscribed polygon, so this is this green guy that looks close to a square but technically is a rectangle. What you would do is you would look at the vertices we currently have. So it's a rectangle, so we've got four vertices on our circle. Having the interior or the central angles means you're going to get create your new inscribed polygon not to have four sides but to have eight sides. In other words, halfway between any two consecutive vertices, we will put a new vertex. So then to get the new polygon, you just connect all these vertices, or these points, and I'm going to freehand it, so it's probably going to look a little wobbly. Here we go. Faster is better less wobbly. That's one of the downsides of using a stylus here is unless you actually pull in some drawing programs, um, it does not look as good as with a straight edge in a piece of paper. All right, so this new guy right here, this would be our P2. Now, to do this process on the circumscribed polygon, we're going to create our second P2 or P2 prime out here. And if you half your um, central angles here, roughly speaking, what it looks like, and I'm not going to be, I'm not going to lie, when I am dealing with circumscribed polygons, I find it easier to actually look at your points of tangency. So notice on the inscribed polygons, the green polygons, what did we do? We looked at the original vertices, and then we went halfway between them. With your circumscribed polygons, I'm going to look at the points of tangency. 
So for example, right here, if we look at the top, we have a point of tangency right there. The next point of tangency is over here, which actually is exactly where we put vertices before. So what I'm gonna do is roughly eyeball it and say halfway. So this guy here would be new vertices on your new circumscribed polygon. We'll do the same thing going around. So also top, but now on the right-hand side. So we have a point of tangency right here. I'll roughly halfway it for them freehanding it. So we'll get a new edge right there and pick up two new vertices. So this means we've now got the top half or top, almost half of our polygon. Now if we look on the bottom, I'm gonna go bottom right-hand corner. So right here where the symbol or the name of this circumscribed polygon is, I'm gonna look between the two points of tangency and roughly cut it off in half here. If you're doing this with a straight edge and compass, you would definitely be much more precise, which is why I went ahead and told you about having the central angles, because that's something you can do with a straight edge and compass. And last bit is this lower left-hand corner, two points of tangency, bottom and on the left, and we'll chop that corner off. So again, roughly eyeballing this. Bam, we got a new side right there. So I'll highlight the new sides. We have part of the original side on top, part of the original side on the right, part of the original side on the bottom, and four new sides, which were the slanted, all those slanted lines. Okay. So that new octagon, no guarantees it's regular, but that new octagon, that would be our P2 prime. And it looks like I messed up on the naming convention here a second ago. So let me go ahead and erase that and put the correct name in. Now, what does it mean when this formula up here says we're looking at the difference between our inscribed and our circumscribed polygons? Well, you're specifically here looking at, let me put this in gray, um, the difference between your two areas, which would be looking at this shaded region right here between those two newly formed polygons. So what is that? That is how far off the inscribed polygon is from the actual area that we wanted for the circle, added to how far off the circumscribed polygon is from the actual area that we want for the circle. So putting that all together, if we're able to create polygons inscribed and circumscribed with more and more sides to get this error, essentially the double error, um, of how far off their areas are from the area of the circle, what does this mean? This less than any given quality, quantity, excuse me, says as these sides, number of sides increases for either the inscribed polygon or the circumscribed polygon, those areas of those two polygons are getting closer and closer and closer to the area that we want for the circle. Circumscribed, the area is too big. Inscribed, the area is too small. So let's actually write that down now in words. So, in terms of what you would actually do, you keep on repeating the same process of building um, more and more polygons, but what it actually would tell you is the following results. If you look at the limit as n approaches infinity, where Pn is the circum, not circum, inscribed polygon, look at the area of the inscribed polygon as the number of sides approaches infinity, that will actually turn out eventually to be the same as, I shouldn't say eventually, it will be the same as the limit of the area of the circumscribed polygon as n approaches infinity, the number of sides approaches infinity, and that limit value is itself the area of the circle. Now, this whole thing in the proposition up top where we're talking about, you'll be able to find your polygons where this difference is smaller than some quantity, how is that used? That actually deals with error. Uh, so in terms of what it's dealing with, suppose you need the area of your circle only accurate to two decimal places. This would say that, hey, you can find two polygons, an inscribed and a circumscribed polygon where their difference is less than a two decimal place accuracy. Then you could either 
find the area of the inscribed polygon or find the area of the circumscribed polygon, and those two areas will be accurate, will be the same within two decimal places, and that number will exactly be the area of your circle accurate to two decimal places. This is one of the ways that people developed the formula for the circle. And in fact, if you're interested in this, um, when Euclid and Archimedes were doing this, they were actually developing or using this way of finding the area of a circle by finding polygons with more and more sides. This is how they actually figured out, oh, there's this ratio going on, this pi. And they were able to get it pretty accurate. Um, actually, let me write this down. So here's a note. I found this interesting when I saw this for the first time. Archimedes actually found the following, and he used the exact method that we just did right here to find that 3 and 10 over 71, pretend that was a 10, is less than pi, is less than 3 and 1 seventh. Okay. And that was actually calculating polynomials with more and more sides. So that was some of the stuff that people did. But that's how we actually developed the notion of pi and how we now get the formula for the area of the circle. But that's it for this one. All right. So the next famous problem that we want to look at is something called doubling the cube. But this one, we actually need a little bit of algebra background before we can talk about the problem itself. So. Remind yourself of a couple things that we need. We'll do the little bit of uh, talk about the little bit of algebra that we want, and then we'll jump into the next example of a famous problem. So here's the stuff that we've talked about in the past, and it's specifically about constructible numbers. So let's start with a constructible point because that's a typical place where you start. So here, some point alpha beta can be constructed simply with a straight edge and a compass if the following things happened. You started off by forming the x and the y coordinate, the alpha and the beta, from fractions, so from the field of rationals, and you only did a certain number at some point you stopped, there was no limit involved, a certain number of operations where those operations can only include adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, and taking square roots. Okay? So any operation that doesn't deal with those guys, you're not allowed to do, so no limit. No cube roots, unless you can write it in terms of something else. Um, no sines or cosines going on in this current context. Technically speaking, with sines and cosines, if you deal with a different type of uh, process, you can actually deal with them too, but not for these points. So if you want a specific real number or a specific number here to be constructible, um, the actual set of all numbers that are constructible is called K. It's actually a field. And this consists of all of the numbers that you started from fractions, so any rational number. And then you combine your rational number or numbers together by way of those same five operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and picking square roots. So in other words, your constructible numbers are the individual coordinates you get, the points constructible if it consists of an x and a y coordinate that are both constructible numbers. So there's the interplay, and we've dealt with those before. So let us jump into the new thing. And this problem that we're going to look at, this famous question, is in section 28 of your textbook. I believe 28 is, yeah, it's in chapter 6. So here, proposition 28.1 gives you a condition on when to tell if a number is constructible or not. Now, no lies, lots and lots of numbers. It's super easy to tell if they're constructible just by looking at how they're written. Namely, look for pluses, minuses, multiplications, divisions, square roots, and fractions. If you've got something other than that, it's not constructible. Okay? But sometimes you don't have the exact expression of the number you're looking for. All you have is some sort of property associated to it. And in that case, sometimes it's nice to have this extra thing. Okay? So Proposition 28.1 says, your real number alpha is constructible if and only if there exists something called a finite chain of subfields, where the subfields involved are F with the appropriate subscript, so the subscript is index I will change, and these guys are subfields of R. 
remember what a field was. A field was somebody that basically replicated R. You had addition that act nicely, multiplication that act nicely. You had a zero element, you had a one element, you had all your negative numbers, you had all of your inverses. I'm about to lie to you, i.e. your reciprocals. No, you can't really do them like that, but when you're dealing with rationals to real numbers, it's okay to think of them as reciprocals, okay? And you also have the distributive law. So a subfield is simply a subset, so some smaller set of, in this case, real numbers, that is still a field, okay? So that's all it is. Now, the chain part refers to the fact that you can link these guys all together with our subset symbol, okay? So you start off and the smallest thing you have is your smallest field, uh, field of rationals. At the top, you've got your biggest one involved, which is your real numbers, and every other one of these subfields that you built can be stacked. You've got one of them that's just a little bit bigger than rational numbers, next one is a little bit bigger still, and you keep building until you get to the very last one. Now you can do that with lots of random and arbitrary things. And technically here, just as an add-on, your book, puts it as the normal subset notation, these actually need to be proper subsets. Okay. But there are some conditions. In fact, there are two conditions. The first one is your number alpha, this number who's supposed to be constructible. It has to be in the last subfield, but none of the prior subfields. Okay. So this is the first subfield where your constructible number alpha lives. The second condition is how you actually build all of these subfields, all of these fields that are b properly between the set of rationals and the set of real numbers, or the field of rationals, field of real numbers. And that specifically, you get the new one by adding in a square root that wasn't in the previous field. So specifically here, you take some element, so say we're building F2, take some element from F1, it's element F, the element from F1 is properly in F1, but the square root of that guy is not. So then you say, oh, well, that's the new element. Let me throw in my new square root. And when you throw the new square root into your field, you now have built a bigger field. Okay, so that's how these guys will progress. So in terms of how this would look, okay, let me actually write out what we just said. Each new subfield is where you include a new square root. And here would be an example. Suppose you have Q. Let me get out of bed there. What's the number that's in Q? So in a set of rationals, fractions. Uh, well, integers can always be written as fractions, so they're rational. So maybe you pick the number 5. Okay. So you pick a 5, 5 is totally in Q, but square root of 5 is not a rational number. So what we can do is to build the next subfield bigger, we can say, hey, I'm going to throw in the square root of 5. I just threw in one, exactly one new square root. Okay. Now I'm not going to go any further. I'm going to say let's go ahead and end it here and we'll get up there to our real number for our next one. And the thing to remember here is when you throw in your new square root, this, whoops, don't want an equal yet. So Q and throw in a new square root. This guy will look like all of the elements of the form, A plus B square root five, where A and B are rationals. In other words, it's not just one new element, it's all combinations where square root five can interplay and be added and multiplied by all of the other elements inside of your field. Now, the second thing, and there's only two facts in section 28 that we're ne going to need to worry about. The second fact that we have is says, if you've got this number alpha is a constructible number, then it turns out that mess has to equal a power of two. So one, realistically, you'll never have one. Two, four, eight, 16, 34, et cetera, two to some power. No negative powers, and technically speaking, you should never actually see um, one is. All right, now, what does this degree of Q adjoint alpha mod out by alpha actually mean? Well, we're gonna talk about that by way of an example here in just a second, but let me, 
um, talk about how it's actually used, and then we'll see what this degree thing means. Okay. In terms of how it's actually used, you do the following. You calculate what this degree thing is, and again, we'll talk about what the degree of Q adjoin alpha mod out by Q is in just a second. And if that degree is not two to some power, where K represents your sum power, some integer, then what does this tell you? This is gonna tell you that your number alpha is not constructible. So if somebody asks you to, hey, here's a real number, go and try to construct it, and you're like, you know what, this looks complicated. I'm not sure if that's actually gonna work. If you double check what that degree thing is, which we haven't defined it yet, um, and it comes out to something like seven, seven is not a power of two, and that would tell you, hey, you're right, there's no way that this number could be constructible, and so if somebody told you to do it, you respond with, nope, I'm sorry, that is not a constructible number, there's no way I could possibly construct it with a straight edge and so that would be how this corollary is used. It actually turns the previous proposition on its head to say, what's going on here? All right, so let us figure out what this degree thing is. And I've got a couple of examples prepped up for us. And for these examples, we'll do a couple of things. We're gonna try to build a finite chain. And we're also gonna look to see what this degree thing would be applicable to this particular example. And all of these are different examples of your alpha. Now, first thing. With this particular alpha, which is square root of two, we know something. We know this guy is constructible. Is constructible. In fact, when we were back in section 13, we actually saw how we could construct it. Okay. Now, what does that mean? This means then by that original proposition, so proposition 28.1, this means we're gonna be able to find a finite chain. So a finite chain in the same format of the proposition exists. I'm gonna go ahead and just end with exists there just because I'm about to fall off the edge of the, the screen right there. Okay. And we know this thing is constructible because notice two is an integer or a rational number and the only operation acting on it is the square root which is one of our five allowable operations. Now, Second thing we know, if we wanted to try to build our finite chain, here's how you always start. You always start with Q. The next thing you do for the next field is you throw in a square root that's not currently in Q uh, and say Q adjoin that new square root. So any guesses what square root we should throw in here? And remember what the goal is. The goal is for the very last subfield, in other words, we wanna build up to a subfield that actually includes alpha. So we want a subfield that actually has square root two in it. Anybody have a guess on what square root we should throw into here? In other words, our very first subfield. Yeah, this one here is as simple as just throwing square root two in. Now, why can we go ahead and just throw in square root two? Because square root two, not currently in the set of rationals, so you couldn't have stopped just at Q. Two, however, is in the set of rationals, so throwing in just a square root two, totally cool right here. You didn't have to do anything else. And what happens next? Well, we now have alpha in this field, so end it with the real numbers, or the field of real numbers. Now, putting this together, Let's explain a couple of things. Now, we talked previously about what Q adjoin a square root would look like. So in our particular case, this guy would look like some fraction plus some fraction times square root two. So that's what this field would look like. Now, we also talked about how we wanted to deal with um, this notion that we just barely scrolled off the top of the page of this degree of Q will join alpha mod out by square, mod out by Q. Okay, so I'm just gonna keep that up here at the top, I'm not regretting that space. All right, so let's calculate this guy. If we look at, where's a good thought here? If we look at this field, specifically the elements in this field, 
as a vector space. So as a vector space. And specifically, here's the bits that we need to deal with in terms of looking at that set as a vector space. We want to know what are the basis vectors and who would be our constants. Well, in terms of our constants, our constants are going to be Q. Okay. Now, in terms of our basis vectors, anybody have a guess on who our basis vectors would have to be. No. Ooh, closer. That is actually one of them. There is another one. Any guesses what the other one is? The other one's more subtle to find. Ooh, no, it's not square root two. I sorry, negative square root two. And that's simply because negative one is uh, in the set of rationals. So it's just a constant times your the other basis vector. Ooh, it's not zero. Zero would actually turn out to be your zero element. But you guys are getting closer, sort of. There you go. It's a one. Now, why would we say that the two basis vectors are one and square root two? Please notice you don't actually have a stack of vectors in Rn where n is two or bigger. Okay. So I'm going to put this little scratch work to the side over here. If we look at a plus b square root 2, notice this thing is the same as a times 1 plus b times square root 2. This tells you that your basis vectors, the things that are not changing, are the 1 and the square root 2, and that's how you can pull your basis vectors when you look at this field in terms of a vector space. Okay. Now, what can you do with a vector space? One of the things that people always look at with a vector space is they look at the dimension of the vector space. So what would be the dimension of this guy as a vector space? Any guesses? So the dimension is always just the number of your basis vectors. So in this particular case, it's just going to be two. Now, let's tie it into the geometry stuff. Okay. So we had previously, said we were looking at the degree of Q adjoin alpha, or in our case, Q adjoin square root two, mod out by Q. Now this actually has some fancy meaning in and of itself with respect to algebra. I'm not gonna go in that direction just because modern algebra is not a prereq to this course, and we don't need all of that extra stuff. But linear algebra is a prereq, so here's what this means in terms of as a vector space. This here says you started off with the main vector space or the main set as Q adjoins square root 2. The mod out, the thing on the bottom, tells you who your constants are. So this tells us we're going to treat all of our Q numbers, our rational numbers, as the constants. The degree here then it tells you it's like saying, find the dimension of the vector space where Q is your set of constants. So that's the tie into linear algebra right here. So our answer is two, the same as before. Now, the degree actually comes from something of building polynomials and figuring out what that highest polynomial is. We're not gonna go into that right now. Although we totally could, but too close to the end of the semester. Okay. Now, check. We calculate this guy right here, and we have Q adjoined square root two mod out by Q. We got that it was two. If we apply our corollary, our corollary says your alpha, or square root two, is gonna be constructible, or if it's constructible, then we should get this expression as a power of two. Did we get a power of two? Don't overthink this. Yeah, we got a power of two that totally holds up under what that corollary was telling us. 
note, if we had calculated this ahead of time and we got this two, that would tell us that, yeah, it looks like this number probably is constructible. Let's go and see if we can't find this chain now. Uh, if we gotten something like a seven, like we mentioned before, seven not being a power two, don't have to worry about finding any sort of chain to verify that the number is constructible. You can say straight off the bat, not constructible at all. So that's the first example. Now, second example deals with alpha, but now instead of a square root two, I just changed it up with a square root three. This now deals with an operation that's not just a straight up square root two. And the question of course is, is there a way that we could write our square root three in terms of square root twos and maybe some fancy other math? And well, I'm not gonna answer that question because maybe there is and maybe there isn't, but we're not gonna go that direction. Instead, we're gonna say, you know what? That's an operation I'm not sure about. So let's use this corollary that we just talked about, the corollary that says the degree of Q adjoin your alpha, your potential constructible number, brought out by Q needs to equal power of two. So let's see what would happen here. If it gets to be a power of two, then we'll have to start thinking about how we would build our chain. So if we, in this particular case, build up to that degree formula, we'll be looking at Q adjoin alpha or Q adjoin cube root of two. So if we look at this guy, here's what you do. You start off and you throw in, well, all the numbers that don't change if you throw in the cube root of two. So you still have all of your fractions. Now you'll also have all of those numbers that are fractions times the cube root of two. But remember what's going on here with fields. Fields say you have to be able to multiply as many times as you want. You have to be able to add as many times as you want. You have to be able to subtract. Well, if you subtract, it'll be taken care of in these coefficients. You can divide, so we'll deal with that in a second. Um, and you can and, and just combine your addition and multiplication together. Okay? So the multiply as many times as you want is the thing that I'm gonna focus on. So oh, scratch mark over here to the side. If you didn't include the cube root at all, not included at all, there's where we get the no cube root. We include one copy of cube root of two, and well, that's the cube root we already put in there. So these two are sort of automatic ones you think about. But what happens if we multiply two copies of our cube root of two? In this case, because it's not a square root like before, it's a cube root, this is still a root. So this is something that could come up, and there's multiple ways you could simplify this. I'm gonna go ahead and write it as cube root of four. So this means that we need to actually have now a third possible term, which is C times the cube root of four. And I wrote that number totally in the wrong spot. Now, what happens if you go ahead and you try to multiply by another cube root? Well, you'd have cube root of two, but cubed, and what does that guy equal? Anybody have a guess? Mm -hmm. So this one here, when you cube your cube root, totally comes back to a, I did not mean for that to be black yet, totally comes back to the thing under the root, namely your two, which means what happens here, well, this two, totally already taken care of in the very first term that says we are dealing with all rationals. So that means we don't need a fourth term here. We can go ahead and stop these, this format of the different types of terms and just say our A, B, and C can be rational numbers. Huh? Now, if we're still trying to find the degree of Q adjoin, now the current alpha mod out by Q equals something. We don't know what it is. It may not be two anymore. We're gonna look at this guy as a vector space. Now, as a vector space, what happens? We're still gonna be looking at our constants. Vector space. Our constants will still be the Q. Constants. And we'll need to worry about our basis vectors. And then we'll find our dimensions. So anybody have a guess what the basis vectors would be here?
So we'll have one. We'll have cube root of two. And we'll have cube root of, and it's up to you how you write the last one. There's two different ways you can write it. Cube root of four, which is how we wrote it up top. Or if you wanted to, you could actually um, write its fractional powers as well. Now, what does that tell you about your dimension here? And I guess is what your dimension of this set or this field as a vector space would have to be. Yep, and that's a much easier thing to type in. This guy would totally be dimension three, which would tell you your degree of Q adjoining cube root of two mod out by Q has to be three. Notice on the scratch work to the side right over here, this guy is, if you have a simple format like what we have right here, is actually looking at the highest power you have, or you've raised your alpha to, to get back to a rational number. Now, that's not true in more complicated things, but in very basic situations where you just have some sort of root that can't be simplified down any further, um, this is something that this power bit, um, these degrees, if you will, um, is where that name comes from a little bit more. I'm still lying to you a little bit, but it gives you sort of the push in the right direction algebraically. Now, conclusion. What do you guys think? Is cube root of three constructible? And the correct answer would definitely be no. So is not constructible, and we used here corollary, corollary, make sure I get the right number of R's, 28.2, Y since three is not a power of two. So that is on these relatively straightforward numbers, a relatively easy check. Hey, is this guy going to be constructible or not? I'm gonna post an extra example for you guys. Um, not one that we'll go over in class, but an additional example uh, that'll talk about another famous problem. It's whether you can trisect an angle. And I'll turn out there the number that we're trying to see, is it constructible or not? is not something as straightforward as this, and I'll show you the algebra that you would have to go through if you have a less simple uh, situation. And probably about halfway through, you'll be reading it and be like, huh, interesting, I'm so glad we did not have to do that in this class, because the algebra gets a little bit intense in that, the more complicated cases. But for us, this is as, as intense as what we're really gonna need to do. So let's do one more example. So suppose we have this next example. Notice again, it's two to the root. This time it's uh, two to the fourth root. So when we look at this particular guy, there is totally something that you should notice about this real number that's different than the last two roots. Anybody uh, notice anything that's different about this root as opposed to the prior two roots? Don't overthink it. Uh-huh, the root is a power of two-ish. Oh, you just mean the four? That is true. Not what I was going for, but that is true. Maybe it's what I was going for, sort of a roundabout way. I'm gonna claim this. So in a roundabout way, yes, that would have been what I was looking for. Um, now, why would I have rewritten a fourth root of two as the square root of two then taking square root of that again, or the square root of the square root of two is a better way of saying it. Because that is somebody, we can go back to our first way of checking to see if numbers are constructible or not, way back in, what was it? I think the first section of chapter four. And this says what? We have a two that's a rational number, in fact it's an integer, and the only operations going on are two square roots. So what that means is here, we know, that our fourth root of two is constructible. Now, maybe you don't want to construct it, but it is constructible. Now, what would that mean? That would mean 
that a finite field, a finite chain of uh, fields would exist. And that is the same finite chain that is in Proposition 28.1. So just to get some experience on how to put those chains together, um, here's what you would do. So for our finite chain, those finite chains always start with Q or the set of rationals or the field of rationals. They're always going to end with your set or your field of real numbers, and then you put stuff in the middle. Now, remember, in order to build this chain, you can only throw in one root at a time, and it has to be the root of a number that was in the prior field. So, the root of the field, well, we have to take some rational number and then take the square root of that some rational number. So, any guesses what we would throw into this first field? Or Q adjoins something. Any guesses what that something would be? For sure there's a square root. So, this one would be just plain old square root 2. We can't actually throw in the fourth root of 2 here because the fourth root of 2 is the square root of another square root. And that interior or that nested square root right there is not an element of the original field of rationals. It's not a rational number, which means we have to build up to it. Okay? But we can throw square root of 2 in. Now, once we throw square root of 2 in, then we can go ahead and build to our next field. And luckily, we only need one more field because that's all the room I've got. So this guy would be square root of some element from your previous field. And we're hoping, since it's the last bit of space I have there, that this guy here would include our constructible number. So any guesses what we would put inside of that square root? So it would be the square root of 2 that we know for sure is in the previous field right there. Now, for sure, we have our fourth root of 2 written out here as square root of square root of 2. Now, to remind ourselves, our square root of 2 being thrown into the field of rationals look like a plus b times square root 2, both a and b for rational. So then the question, of course, is what is this other guy? So you square root of square root of 2, or if you prefer, Q adjoin the fourth root of 2. Okay. Well, it turns out there's a bunch of different ways that you can look at it. And probably the easiest way that you can look at it goes as follows. Well, you can have only rationals. You can have rationals with square roots of twos. You can have rationals with, I actually don't want to put the square root of two right there. Rationals with fourth roots of two. Rationals with square roots of two. And then other stuff. So let us figure out what that other stuff is. So scratch mark to the side like what we did previously or have done previously. If we are now throwing in this fourth root of 2, we have fourth root of 2 is a 0. We have our fourth root of 2 that we've already listed out. We have our fourth root of 2 squared. Quick check, fourth root of 2 squared is what? Anybody got what fourth root of 2 squared is? It is square root 2, and there's where the square root 2 came from. And if you cube this sucker, any guesses what happens? Yep, you could definitely write it in fractional form. That is true. I'm not going to just because I'm lazy. Uh, so you could totally say that this is the fourth root of 8. This is also the same thing as square root 2 times fourth root 2. 
and it's also the fractional power, which is perfectly fine to use as well. So let's go ahead and insert that term because we didn't have it yet. So this guy is d square root 2, fourth root 2. And since I ran out of space with the vertical line, let's hope the next one doesn't need to be added into the list. And fourth root of 2 to the fourth power is just 2. So, yep, that previous one was the last one we need to worry about. And because we started from dealing with rationals, we have our A, B, C, and D are all rational numbers. Okay. Now, before we jump on to our next thing, which is going to deal with the same degree of Q adjoin the fourth root of 2 modulated by Q to figure out what that guy equals, I do want to go ahead and do something a little bit different. In terms of throwing in a new root, technically speaking here, what we did is we took our Q adjoined square root 2 and we threw in this fourth root of 2. Or really, we didn't really throw in the fourth root like that. We threw in the square root of the square root of 2. Now, it turns out that when you throw in something, namely this fourth root of 2, where when you raise it to the various powers, like right here you square it, you get this same deal. This thing here simplifies to exactly that guy. So those two things go together. Now, put this all together, if we tried to calculate the degree of Q adjoin our fourth root of 2, mod out by Q, anybody have a guess what that number should be? So this number should totally be 4, and notice right here, 1, 2, 3, 4, we had those four terms that we were coming from. Now, we also have another thing that perhaps you've noticed. If you have, where you're trying to find the degree of Q adjoin some root, some nth root mod out by Q, and the root, the number inside of the radical, this A is not reducible. Now, not reducible is actually a really technical term, but in terms of what we're going to be looking at, this is the same thing as saying uh, A's prime. Technically speaking, not reducible and prime are two different definitions, but when you're in the real numbers, they're going to essentially equate to the same thing. So anybody have a guess based on what we've calculated in those last three examples of what we should get for our answer? In other words, our general formula right there. If you have Q adjoin a prime number, the nth root of a prime number mod out by Q, yep, it turns out it will be exactly, I did not mean for that to be orange. It'll be exactly whatever that um, root is. And that's true whether it's a cube root, a fifth root, somebody that gives you back a not power of two, or whether it was something like our other examples of a square root or a fourth root where we did get back powers of two. That's sort of a fast way of dealing it. If that A is not a prime number, so if you had something like square root of six, in those cases, um, things can be a little bit different. Um, especially different would be something like if you had uh, a not prime, A is not a prime, and it actually simplifies things. So, for example, maybe you had the square root of 4. So, A is 4, and then you N is 2, so square root of 4 up there. Well, square root of 4 is 2. 2 is already an, an integer, so it's inside of Q already. So, in that case, all of this stuff would collapse, and you really wouldn't be talking about anything other than just Q. That would be one of those times when you'd actually get a degree equals 1, which is pretty rare. In other words, it means you screwed up in how you put the stuff together, at least in our context. All right, so we now have enough information to go ahead and talk about the famous problem that we wanted to, and the famous problem that we want to talk about is doubling the cube. So here is the setup. Uh, you're given some cube. Now, this is probably the only example that we're going to have in class that de or this semester that deals with three-dimensional geometries. Everything else that we've been talking about deals with has dealt with two-dimensional geometry, or in the future will deal with two-dimensional geometry. So 
there's a couple of background assumptions that you have to make here. One is that you know what a cube is and you are comfortable in three-dimensional stuff. So I'm assuming that that is true. Okay? So we're going to start off with some cube, and I'll draw a picture here in just a second. We're then going to try to construct a second cube, and the word here, construct, does mean use a straight edge and compass, and your author of your textbook does actually have a section on what does that mean when you talk about three-dimensional space. Well, here's roughly what it means. You still would use your straight edge and compass, but now in terms of where your quote unquote piece of paper would live, on the base it'd be like putting it on a, on a table, but then to get your sides and your top, it'd be like you moved your piece of paper and then did all of your straight edge and compass stuff up there in space. Okay. So it, it takes a little bit more imagining to do this. Okay. So we're gonna get a second cube, and the goal here of this second cube is we want to have one whose volume is twice that of the original cube. Okay. So let's set up what's going on. And I'm gonna go ahead and draw pictures because hey, it's a geometry class. If we don't draw pictures, we've probably done something wrong. The first thing is given a cube. Okay. So I'm gonna do a really rough drawing of a cube. And that sort of looks like a cube. We'll try to make it look a little bit 3D here. There's our cube. And let's suppose that we know the length of one of the sides of the cube is going to be the length of A. Okay. So let A be the length of an edge. Let's pretend I could spell edge of the original cube. Then if you wanted to calculate the volume, what would the volume be? Don't overthink it. Mm -hmm. So this would simply be a cubed, and the assumption here is that you remember a cube has what? all the lengths of all the sides are the same. In other words, every single edge of the cube is congruent to each other. Now, when we look at our second cube, so consider a second cube. So here we're gonna let B be the length of an edge of this second cube. And I'll go ahead and draw a little diagram over here. Don't overthink it. I'm going to make this picture a little bit smaller. I realize that's not scale wise how it should be. This one should be the larger cube. Oh no. My perspective was a little off. There's the length B. Then the volume here is what? Don't overthink it. What should I write right here? Perfect. So this would be B cubed. So same formula, only now with a B. Now, here was our goal. Our goal is that the volume of the second cube is twice the volume of the first cube. So here's what we need. You got it. So in terms of putting that together, we need our B cubed to be exactly that two A cubed. Okay. Now, in order to, to deal with this, no, you don't have to construct the first cube. That's the one that's given. Okay. The second cube is the one you need to construct. So in terms of constructions, what has to happen? You have to construct one of the sides. Once you can construct one of the sides, you can construct the base, it's just a square, we know how to do that. And if you can construct a square, you'll copy it to the other five sides of the um, cube. Now, 
we might not have done constructions in three dimensions, but notice what all of that starts with. We have to be able to construct the one of these edges right here. Okay? So if we can construct one of those edges, we can construct the entire cube. Okay? So not only do we have to have that D cubed equals two times A cubed in order to be constructible, so and to be constructible, i.e. the second cube to be constructible, is that word, sorry about that. What has to happen? We need the actual length of one of the edges, so that number B, to be a constructible number, or it's just called to be constructible. Ah, that was trying to be an A. Namely, B was inside the set of the constructible numbers. Huh? So, first of all, let's solve for the length that B has to be. So solve for B, and then we'll do the analysis of whether B is a constructible or number or not. So if we wanted to solve for B, we've got that B cubed equals 2A cubed. Solve for B, what do you have to do? Don't overthink it. We're just going to take the blank of both sides. You're right. Take the cube root of both sides, so I'll do this in two steps. Cube root both sides, we'll get 2A cubed. I'll do the easy part. There's an A that comes out. Now, the non-easy part and the part that's definitely the hardest to type, so if any of you almost have it typed awesome, is going to be dealing with that 2. Now, the 2 is not going to be able to come out of the root. Why? Because 2 is not a power of 3. So what you're going to have is while the A cube will pull out of the root, here you'll still have a cube root of 2. Now, you're given A. So, regardless of what's going on here, you already have A, you just have to scale it somehow. And that's something that can be done with a straight edge and compass. Okay? The part that you would still have to worry about, though, is you would have to be able to construct the cube root of 2. What do you guys think? Can we construct the cube root of 2? Yeah, so since it's not constructible, and we saw that just a little bit ago, that's totally why I did cube root of 2 earlier. So since we already found that cube root of 2 is not a constructible number, what does this tell us? This tells us that B, which is some other number, times the cube root of 2, is also not constructible. So, what does this tell us? Our conclusion to this whole problem is that second cube we were shooting for, that second cube we were trying to construct, is not constructible. Not with a straight edge and compass. Could you do something in terms of limits? Sure. Could you do something maybe computer generated with a computer graphics program? Sure. Could you do something if you were only going out to a certain number of decimal places? Sure. But in terms of precision, in, it, in terms of using your straight edge and compass, no, that's not something that you're actually able to do here. Huh? Questions make sense? Kind of feeling okay-ish. Ish being the keyword there. All right. Well, that's it for that famous problem of doubling the cube. This is something that actually for most of the famous problems that you see, um, or at least the ones that your book talks about, most of them the conclusion is, nope, I'm sorry, you can't do that. And that's probably one of the reasons why they were so famous. People worked on them for a long time, sometimes up until the math actually got invented that would work to help solve out on the problem. One of the reasons that they were worked on so long was because there was no solution or it couldn't be done. So people were just spinning their wheels. All right, so that deals with famous problems. So for the last few minutes, I want to give you a brief preview of what's going on with non-Euclidean geometry, some of the basics. Turns out we've actually already dealt with non-Euclidean geometry in this course. I just 
don't think I told you when it was. Okay? So let's do a couple preliminary stuff and then we'll look at examples next time. So non-Euclidean geometry. Start off before we actually jump into non-Euclidean geometry, there's a couple of big things we need to remember. One is neutral geometry and the other one actually is Euclidean geometry. If I wrote out neutral geometry, I forgot to write out Euclidean geometry. So neutral geometry is simply a geometry where Hilbert axioms of incidence, betweenness, and congruence are all satisfied. Please note, neutral geometry is just another name for a Hilbert plane. Eh, there are some distinguishing features. Neutral geometry doesn't guarantee play for its axiom holds. Um, it could either hold or not. Actually, that's exactly the same as a Hilbert plane. Um, play for its axiom could either hold or not hold. Okay. Now, if you look at full-on Euclidean geometry, so not non-Euclidean geometry, but regular old Euclidean geometry, Remember, it's a Hilbert plane where you have both Playfair's axiom holding, so parallel lines work nicely, and you also have the circle axiom holding. Non-Euclidean geometry is a Hilbert plane where one or both of either Playfair's axiom and or the circle axiom don't hold. Maybe both of them don't hold, maybe exactly one of them doesn't hold. We're specifically going to look at the situations where Playfair's axiom doesn't hold, and we're going to ignore that circle axiom. And what we're going to get are things called semi, mispronouncing, semi, and then the normal buzzword. Okay. And we'll talk about that more uh, either a little bit later today or at the very beginning of next time. So non-Euclidean geometry, you either have Playfair's axiom not holding or... Um, Circle axiom not holding or both, we're specifically only going to look at Playfair's. So for us, we're going to be looking at when Playfair's axiom doesn't hold. Now, there are a couple of things to look at. The first one is a Euclidean triangle. This is the standard triangle that you've played with since whenever you first um, dealt with triangles on a piece of paper. So this is where the interior angles of your triangle all sum to 180 degrees, that thing that you always want to assume. Now, if Playfair's axiom doesn't hold in a non-Euclidean triangle, your interior angles would sum to something that is not 180 degrees. Okay. And last thing down here is dealing with something called a defect, the defect of a triangle or the defect of your geometry is going to be how far off that angle sum is from 180 degrees. So it's 180 degrees minus whatever angle sum you actually have. So if the angles add up to something like 150 degrees, this guy would be positive. If the angles actually add up to something like 200 degrees, this would be negative. So your defect would be zero or positive or negative. So here, just as a side comment, note, defect is only going to be zero if you are in or have a Euclidean triangle. So Euclidean, right. yeah. Tying that together, theorem 34.7 talks about how you can look at the triangles and figure out what type of plane you're in, whether it's you Euclidean or non-Euclidean. So here's what you would look at here. There are three situations. If you look at any Hilbert plane, if you can find in your Hilbert plane some triangle where the sum of all of those angles adds up to something that's less than 180 degrees, then it turns out all of the triangles in the Hilbert plane will sum, the angles will sum. So have an angle or angle sum that is less than 180 degrees. Okay. Now, second bullet point. Suppose you have a Hilbert plane and you found a triangle where the sum of all the angles, the interior angles, is 180 degrees. It turns out then that guarantees that you have a rectangle and vice versa. Following our equivalent means if you have one of these conditions, you have all of them. And the last property here says, well, if you've got one triangle that sums up to 180 degrees for its angles, turns out every triangle has an angle sum of 180 degrees. It turns out that regardless of what the sum of the angles add up to, all triangles in your Hilbert plane will have that same sum 
So we're going to get the same result down here in part three, which says if you've got some triangle who the sum of the angles is greater than 180 degrees, then all of your triangles will have that same angle sum that is greater than 180 degrees. And that allows us to look just at our triangles to determine what type of Hilbert plane we actually have. Okay. So I went ahead and drew up a triangle for us. I went ahead and also named our angles in terms of when we're talking about degrees here. That way I can be using a little algebra. And we're going to look at what happens when we have these three different types of sums of angles. Okay. It turns out that there are three different types of things that you could have. You could have Euclidean. Semi-Euclidean here simply means we're only looking at Playfair's axiom. And then we can also have either elliptic or hyperbolic plane. Now, these last two guys are both different types of non-Euclidean geometry. And the semi in the front of the two words, again, tells us that we're only referring to Playfair's axiom holding or not holding in the geometry. We're ignoring our circle axiom. So here's what's true across the board. Playfair's axiom is only going to hold in the first one. In the second two guys, the semi-elliptic and the semi-hyperbolic, Playfair's axiom does not hold. And that's the key thing that tells you that those last two guys are um, non-Euclidean geometries. The sum of all of the angles of your triangle exactly 180 degrees in the Euclidean plane. In the other two, your angle sum is not going to be 180 degrees. One of them is going to be greater than 180 degrees, and one of them is going to be less than 180 degrees. Elliptic is where it's greater than 180 degrees, and hyperbolic is where it is less than 180 degrees. And let me get you the pictures and we'll end on the pictures. Okay. So to visualize this, a semi-Euclidean geometry totally looks like a flat piece of paper. Okay. That's it. Now, in terms of the elliptic geometries, these guys, the classic example is on the surface of a sphere. So you get your points of your triangle, and if you follow the surface of the sphere, here your lines bow out a little bit. And if we actually did a classic equilateral triangle for each of these guys, notice here, each of these guys would be greater than 60 degrees, and that's where you get your angle sum that's greater than 180. And last picture, in the hyperbolic case, you have what looks like a figure that curves in. In this situation, if you go ahead and you have your three vertices, and here, you've got something that looks like that. And if this guy is still something like an equilateral triangle, in that situation, notice those angles all look like they're less than 60 degrees each. So you're looking here where you've got um, your uh, angle sum is less than 180. Whoops, erased the wrong thing there. Okay, so that would be the idea. And that's it for, for our non-Euclidean stuff.